Good morning. Um, so for our uh, early morning panel today, we're going to talk about a quite a different topic than some of the topics yesterday. We're going to talk about space culture, cultural, legal, and ethical issues. And I have uh, up here a very diverse panel of people that is going to that are going to help us uh, to address this topic from multiple perspectives. So I'm Roger Molina. I'm going to try and chair the proceedings and control my colleagues. Uh, my background is as an astrophysicist and a space scientist. Uh, I've spent my scientific career building instruments that have been launched into space uh, to observe uh, the sky for astronomical purposes. But I recently joined the faculty here at UT Dallas. Uh, I'm the chair of Earths and Technology, but I also have an appointment in the, in the Department of Physics. And so for many, many years, as you'll find out from my presentation, I've been very interested in the cultural implications of the work I do as a scientist and how that is embedded in societal uh, issues in general. The second speaker, Anik Bureau, is a colleague of mine from Paris. Uh, over the last 15 years, we've worked together uh, with space professionals and with uh, cultural professionals uh, on issues in what we call cultural appropriation of space and she will provide uh, some detailed examples of, of the kinds of exciting uh, work that's going on in the, in the artistic community today. The third speaker will be Fred Turner, who's a colleague of mine here at, uh, at UT Dallas, who's a poet and humanities scholar. And he's going to uh, introduce a, a very different topic into this, which is terraforming <coughs> environmental hubris or second genesis. Uh, and it's a very interesting discussion because yesterday we discussed some of the uh, embedded philosophical values in ecology in general, deep ecology, different kinds of diversities. Uh, and so here, obviously, as some people start imagining, uh, appropriating other planets and spreading our own life forms there, you get into philosophical, environmental, and ethical issues. And finally, I'm really pleased to have Judge John McClellan Marshall uh, here, who will be the last speaker on the panel. Uh, I know him because he and I uh, were both elected to the International Academy of Astronautics. He's a sitting Texas judge, and you might ask, what the hell is he doing in the Academy of Astronautics? Uh, and he, he will tell you. Uh, and he will talk about cyber ethics in the 21st century, uh, the reign of the machines. So we're really going to address uh, this general topic area of in, in very diverse fashions, and I hope in the discussion period we can unpack uh, some, of those, uh, some of those issues. Um, I was able to sit in yesterday uh, to some of the, uh, the discussion in the panels, uh, and I kind of lashed on to this issue of epip epistemic values and non-epistemic values. And so I guess for me a cultural value is non-epistemic. Uh, what it does is somehow capture how people in a society imagine their possible futures and what possible futures are desirable. And so I would certainly situate cultural uh, values in the non-epistemic uh, domain. Um, and so the question that I want to ask this morning is whether humans have become a space culture. And I think you can discuss this uh, from a number of angles. Obviously, uh, from the dawn of time, as people have looked up at the sky, they have imagined going there. And so clearly, uh, almost all human cultures have uh, with embedded in their mythologies uh, some of that speculation, human speculation, about uh, going into the sky. Secondly, of course, uh, what made the space age possible was a political appropriation. It was a confluence of factors uh, where space became uh, a, um, a, a terrain of competition in the Cold War where indeed the space became a political uh, appropriation that drove uh, a number of countries uh, to, to, to enter into space activities. But as recently as last week, we saw North Korea trying to dis display its capability of launching something into space, basically as a political act, um, uh, which they failed the first time, but I suspect they'll succeed the second time. Third, uh, social appropriation. Um, and I guess the example I like to give, I mean, in the Academy of Astronautics, some of the first professionals to enter that academy in the 1960s were lawyers. So the lawyers very quickly got involved in space activities, basically sectors of society worrying about the social implications of a human activity. 
Um, the first artist was elected to the International Academy of Astronautics, I think, in the 1990s. <laughs> so it took a very long time before that particular social organization recognized that artists had a role in space. Economic appropriation, and there, I guess the argument I like to make is if today this group decided that beginning tomorrow morning, nobody would be allowed to launch a rocket again, how quickly do you think our civilization would collapse? Really quickly, because of course the stock market and many of our other embedded mechanisms now are so dependent upon space systems that in fact uh, the society has been adapted to the existence of those space systems. And finally, uh, the cultural appropriation that Anik will talk about, uh, which uh, is, is something which has not yet uh, been carried out, but maybe with space tourism, we see the first uh, hints uh, of, a, of a true cultural appropriation. As I mentioned, uh, I've been involved in this area for a number of years. A few years ago, uh, in the International Federation of Astronautics, we set up a technical activities activity for the cultural utilization of space. And basically, it's a, it's a working group, it's a technical committee that tries to help artists and cultural professionals get into space. That's a young dancer who's in zero gravity, uh, Kitsu de Bois, access to space data or to space technologies which may be used in other purposes. And so that committee includes museum directors, uh, space agency officials, trying to imagine uh, uh, various ways that cultural activities in space could be carried out. And of course, there have been a few. Um, some Hollywood companies have filmed material on board space vehicles for use in the entertainment industry. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, in 1995, which is a while ago, I, I kind of looked at what was going on and defined a number of type, uh, typologies of space art. I made a very dis clear distinction about art that happened after the space age, after the first human started going into space and what I call astronomical art, which happened before um, the space age began. And then uh, three contextual categories of whether the cultural activity was intended for people living in space, people living on the earth, and, and so on. Um, one could almost look at this in a different, slightly different way as a historian, uh, where the astronomical arts uh, existed until the launch of Sputnik, clearly at that point, there was a clear break uh, in the human culture when access uh, to space became a physical reality. And then uh, space art of the space age, uh, political art, and in fact, we were at the DMA uh, yesterday, and there's a huge painting by Robert Rauschenberg, commissioned by NASA. He, was, he went to a lot of the Apollo launches, and so there's official culture uh, as a political uh, statement. Um, now, uh, something new is going on, and, and Anik will talk about it, which is uh, that space activities are being spread to different kinds of people. Obviously, there are now paying customers on space vehicles, and that, that's a, a, a new development. Uh, but there's the Google X Prize, uh, as you probably know, which is a private effort to launch vehicles to the moon. Um, and so the issue of civilian access to space or non-military and non-governmental access to space will be the next uh, historical breakpoint. Um, so just a, a couple of other words on space art as space culture. As I said earlier, from my point of view, space culture began, begins at the point when a society has embedded within its way of functioning space activities. And so that's a very recent development. And so in the same sense that we now talk about people who are born digital uh, in the digital age, there are people who are born in the space age. And indeed, it's quite interesting when you look at the work of young artists who are 18 years old, the space age is a historical artifact that's part of their general uh, cultural mythologies. They're born uh, as space in, in the space culture, and they have a very different attitude than, than we do who lived through uh, that period. Um, one of the points that I also like to make is how the political uh, vision has been evolving. Recently, I was at a head of meetings of space agencies, and the head of the Indian Space Agency gave his elevator speech about why to go into space, and it was all about living on the Earth in harmony and how space could be used to bring the Earth into equilibrium. Nothing about the, the, the myth of the, of the frontier, the American myth of the frontier, a very different 
uh, uh, conceptual mythology that the Indian Space Agency was articulating of why India should invest in space activities, all about managing the Earth as a system and in equilibrium. Very interesting uh, e evolution. As I mentioned, there are now space, uh, private space activities. Uh, on the right is uh, one of the competitors for the Google X Prize to send a, a private uh, vehicle to the moon. On the left is an example uh, of probably some of the, the best examples of space art today, which actually are hosted by the Japanese Space Agency. They have a very active program with architecture, art, and design schools in Japan. They regularly uh, create cultural artifacts in space on, on the Japanese uh, module of the space station. And so indeed, they have taken a very cultural uh, attitude about involving uh, artists in, the, in their space activities. Finally, just to conclude, I want to talk about a development which it seems to me is, uh, reflects some of the embedding that I'm talk talking about. Remote sensing, as you know, is observing the site, uh, the, the, the Earth from satellites, uh, using it for economic purposes, for uh, disaster management, and so on. Um, recently, there was a conference in Hawaii on community remote sensing, and that was basically about how individual people could start doing their own observation of the Earth. Um, and it's sort of an interesting development because it combines social networking, crowdsourcing, uh, citizen science, um, and uh, it, it's really a, a real a cultural appropriation of these technologies in a way that, that's quite surprising. Uh, one example of that uh, movement is from a young artist at the MIT Media Lab, um, Jeff Warren, who during the oil spill, uh, the BP oil spill, was it, in the Gulf, actually went down there very quickly to the Gulf uh, with webcams on kites and, and high-altitude balloons and just basically documenting the, the pollution on the coast. He actually has better data than BP has on some of the, the polluted areas and so on. And so it was really a, a citizen action uh, using, uh, in that case, a, an artistic tool. Another example of that is uh, last year I was on the jury for the Buckminster Fuller Challenge and we gave one of our awards to the Congo Participatory Mapping Project, a group in the Congo who are fighting the logging companies who claim they're not logging a lot of the areas that they are logging. They use GPS, cell phones, and upload all their stuff onto a shared map to document how the logging companies are currently um, uh, destroying uh, hundreds and thousands of kilometers of, of the tropical forest in the Congo. Now, those people have, probably have no idea of how space activities are necessary to their political uh, movement. It's just part of the way they do things. They have cell phones, GPS, uh, and the shared website. Uh, and, and that data is all flowing around uh, between satellites uh, before it, it lands into, into that, in that project. Very interesting example of how something is so culturally appropriated that it's just become part of the way of doing things. Another example of that I'd like, like to give, which is not space related, some of you have, may have downloaded the app, free application for your cell phone that converts your phone into a Geiger counter. You just block the camera and then let it detect the background radiation that your CCD is detecting, and you can measure the local radioactivity. And what's interesting about that is that then you put it in your pocket, right? So it becomes really part of the way you see the world. And so that cultural appropriation is a very intimate process that really embeds, uh, in that case, space technologies uh, into, uh, into your pocket. So to conclude, uh, cultural appropriation happens through a, a number of different mechanisms. What I'm calling here citizen space or the access to space uh, by individual um, uh, uh, citizens. It's now possible, as you know, for an individual human being to sail around the world by themselves. Imagine 400 years ago how un inconceivable that would have been. All right? Only governments had enough money or trading companies to send ships around the Earth, and now a single human being can sail around the planet by themselves. So maybe 300 years from now, citizens will be going to space just as easily as a solo sailor can go around the Earth. So uh, I'll conclude there. Um, so the question I'd like to ask is, are we a space culture? And I would uh, embed that in the, in the values of a, of a culture in terms of the possible futures that the society imagines that it might take, 
what future outcomes are desirable. And that, of course, is what then young people grow up with in their stomach <laughs> uh, or, or their passions as the kind of activities they'll, they'll get involved in. So I'll conclude there and turn the uh, microphone over to Anik. What we're going to do is we're going to talk, and then we have a full 30 minutes to discuss uh, the presentations. C'est ta première Non. Vous montez plus haut. Non. Comme tu veux faire. <laughs> voilà. Good morning. Uh, I'm really happy and honored to be part of your uh, symposium today, and I will try to discuss what is uh, space. Uh, go. But I need my glasses first. <laughs> Uh, the, well, you, we are in a value and ethic um, center and, and, and symposium, and it's for me pretty obvious that values and culture are tied together, and that values, <coughs> pardon me, are elements of uh, building blocks, I would say, of what a culture is. I think that words, and I suppose um, um, it's obvious for everybody, but I think sometimes it's interesting to restate obvious things. That the words we, the words we use and the way we name things are not neutral, and uh, we need to define um, precisely what we're, we're talking about. And <clears throat> currently there is a, um, a spreading of the expression uh, space culture, which has not been uh, exactly defined and uh, exactly precise what we understand uh, behind that word, space culture. So in this presentation, what I would like to, to do is to make an attempt to sketch what could be or what would be the contour of a space culture. I'm just in 20 minutes going to be only uh, some uh, ideas or, or snapshots. So what is space culture? Is it culture in space? Is it space in culture? Or is it something that I would like at the end of this uh, presentation to talk about, a new trend um, that I think is, is emerging and that I find very interesting. And it's where culture and, and uh, space are blending together in a new way and that I call the space remix. And I hope I will have time to, to explain. Um, so, culture is, is uh, in space. The world culture, like the world values and what, uh, what, they, what they mean, are um, ethnographic and anthropological uh, world. And as you know, on Earth, we have uh, many cultures. Uh, so, obviously, we have brought to space uh, those many cultures, and I will give uh, those many national cultures. Uh, Roger was mentioning the way the Indian uh, Space Agency is envisioning uh, space. Uh, it's true that the mythology in the United States is the, the frontier, right? Uh, Russia, or the Soviet Union at that time, was more this kind of cosmic and cosmological um, approach of bringing into space I mean, envisioning space as um, a fu the future of um, a wonderful um, place for, for humankind and a kind of duplicate of what would be the perfect uh, communist uh, society. So it was a totally different approach. And when you look at the, the paintings in America and the paintings in Russia from that time, they are radically different in their uh, aesthetics. Uh, but it's also culture in space. What we have done is bringing the basic of what defines us as human being. And here is the first example of uh, Paul van Oudonk, uh, with um, Belgium, I think, or Dutch artist, who uh, sent in the um, in, in a, one of the 71 uh, Apollo mission. I think it was Apollo 12. Not entirely sure. Uh, this. Uh, sculpture, this little sculpture, uh, do I have a key? You know, yeah, here, you know, see this little uh, man? It's a 17 centimeters high, it's aluminum, and it's the, the monument to the fallen astronauts, and it's um, a monument to the, to the dead, um, 
celebrating, commemorating the astronaut and cosmonauts that died in mission at that time. And um, what defines us um, as mammals, <laughs> as mu human compared to other um, animals, is that we bury our dead and we erect a monument to our dead. So it takes different shapes in different cultures, but in every culture, in every civilization, we're erecting this kind of, of monuments. So this is bringing uh, the deep roots of human culture into space. Another one is Andy Warhol Moonwalk. As mammals, we're ter ter territorial animals, too. And um, the way we express it is from through different uh, symbols and system. One of it is the flag. And um, for me, this painting uh, is very important because it shows, um, again, a symbol of what makes us human, that is territorializing our space. But at the same time, um, look, at, look at it. The human being is not recognizable anymore as a human being. It does not have a, a face. You don't know if it's a man or a woman. Well, you know it because there were only men on the moon. But uh, you don't know what this being, what this creature is. And the flag has been somehow de-Americanized, if I can use that word. And it's not the, the exact representation of the American flag. It's a flag that is a human flag. Uh, again, representing the, 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 the human. Roger was talking about uh, the Japanese, and uh, they have done an incredible amount of fantastic work. And this one is from Shiro Matsui, and it's called Jewish for, for, for Forest. And it's a garden into the space station. And I have a movie that doesn't want to run in my PowerPoint, but I'm going to try to show it to you anyhow. There is no sound. So this is a garden inside the International Space Station. And as you know, uh, gardens are very important into the Japanese culture. But gardens are also very important into human civilization. Basically, every human civilization has built a model of a garden, which is different from uh, one country or one civilization to another. Um, so, and here it's, that's it. And now I have to come back to my, oh, I'm going to do this. And this is what could be a new model of a garden in a different environment that is in weightlessness and A, and be in a confined environment, that is a garden that you don't go into, as you usually do, that is bigger than yourself and you walk through, but a garden that is um, embedded into those uh, being like um, um, inflatable um, structures. And a garden that you care of and that you embraced instead of being immersed into. And this is also something very important if, you, if we go into space and build a new culture there. That is what kind of um, relation to ourselves and the environment do we get. So, space and culture, the other uh, thing. Um, what is it? What, what is space in culture? Is it the knowledge we have about space? And this, is, this was a quiz for French, well, I heard French teenagers having that quiz in a cafe. And they knew for sure we're in France, right? So we knew for sure it was not Lance Armstrong. They were not quite sure between Louis and Neil. They were about 50, you know, so it was kind of a hard one. Um, but NASA has just recently uh, released same kind of stuff, and it's uh, available through the social networks. I played it uh, on Facebook. Uh, which is basically the same kind of things, um, you know, um, uh, quiz, I mean. Or um, is uh, space in culture, how space activities have impacted everyday life outside uh, their own 
domain. And this is, for instance, a project made by the cultural department of a French space agency where they are asking uh, the public in France to take pictures and send them to populate a database of um, how space is present into their everyday life. And this one is very interesting. The bottom one is a swimming pool. This is uh, the swimming pool in daytime, swimming pool in nighttime that was built in the 70s and spread all over France. And actually, it's a good memory for me. It was my first uh, student job. <laughs> so, but this is interesting to see how um, um, the impact of the imagery of space is present in places you would not think of. Uh, this is um, another example, and this is a chocolate. This is made out entirely out of chocolate, and this was the chocolate um, window in a very, very famous chocolate shop in France. I guess one, you know, 2009 Apollo and so on and so forth. But it was really cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> or is it the progressive acculturation of the way we, am I okay? Yeah. Of the way we perceive the world. And one key thing of our presence in space was to look back and, and to see the Earth as a single uh, unit and to have this idea of having, um, I mean, creating kind of uh, artworks that would be at the scale of the, of the Earth. And this is a project by French artist Jean-Marc Philippe, which was never achieved, which is called, which was called, it's called the Celestine Wheel. And the idea was to put lights on um, geostationary uh, satellite and for special events, let's say switching to year 2000 or having, you know, one, some kind of big celebration, we would lead from Earth all the lights on the satellites and create this celestial will. And this is something that can, that, that can have been thought of only because we have been into space and we had this vision of the entire globe. This has been the same idea has been uh, reprocessed somehow by American artist Richard Clore in 2003 with a work called Collision, and um, you may uh, in, in a totally different, uh, yeah, totally different approach, less uh, utopian and very concrete, which is the orbital debris that are currently um, orbiting the Earth and threatening uh, not only the ISS but all our uh, other. Um, um, satellite of any kind. And re more recently even, restage in, a, in a, an afford approach by a Dutch artist Sander van Hoof, who did um, uh, an augmented reality piece. So basically you download an app from your, for, uh, on your cell phone and this is um, virtual sculpture. So these are those little cubes that are um, virtually and conceptually all around the earth. And, you know, f you, when you, you, you look at them and you can change the color and you have this virtual sculpture which is above your sky wherever you go. So which is superimposing to the actual landscape you are in. And those are, f are exactly f um, the same concept, the same idea but treated in three different way that shows how outer space and the way we are a, a single system is just basic and normal for people, has gone basic and normal for, for people. So now I want to go to my space remix um, this, uh, thing. What is space remix? It's how pieces of history are becoming part of our, our everyday life. It's how um, um, icons and um, um, components of what has made uh, space um, activity are reprocessed, reused, uh, remixed into art projects. I want and we'll go very briefly. This was uh, a net art piece by Slovenian artist Igor Stromaja in 97, where he reused uh, Valentina Tereshkova and Yuri Gagarin uh, into, um, into a work that was how, do you are, how are you uh, lonely 
<coughs> at home, um, behind your computer, you are connected, you are on many networks, uh, but you're just alone in front of your computer, and it was this kind of relationship uh, how you are alone behind your computer, how those people, which two people were alone uh, into their capsule. Uh, Yuri Gagarin was, of course, a hero of the Soviet Union, but he has become a hero of uh, humankind. And Yuri's Night actually started, uh, was a project that started in the United States of America and not in Russia, would you believe? And um, it has become a world, you know, the world party of the 12th of April was two days ago, where people are doing stuff in their local area. And, um, um, yeah, um, celebrating, uh, the, you know, the next step of human, that is, I'm out, okay. Um, and what I think is really uh, fun here is here is night, world space party in second life. And I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure that the, the people who started the Soviet Union space program really imagine Yuri Gagarin in second life. Well, you know, um, kind of breaking also this official uh, ceremony and progress of uh, the different cultures. So, same with the moon landing, of course. And this is a project done by Chinese artist Yu Yan Wang, and he or she, I don't know if it's a woman or a man, is restaging the moon landing through an installation and she, he or she is taking on the left the real shots from the moon landing from NASA and refilming the exact um, pictures. Um, another project also dealing uh, with, and again, I mean, in the United States, and not only in the United States, but in the United States, the moon landing is really one uh, key moment uh, for the proudness of the American civilization and the American culture. And those people are just retaking all this, reshuffling the pictures, playing with it, and making it um, uh, f for everyone in a way, in, and desacralizing uh, the whole thing. So this is German artist Agnes Meyer Brandes, who is combining, an, I, don't know if I think it's 17th century, this I have to check, yes, yeah, 17th century, um, tale that a man went to the moon uh, using moon gears that were attracting uh, um, a car, okay? Uh, so she, 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 has, she, she has trained real geese and uh, restaging it but mixing it with, of course, uh, the Apollo missions. So here we have Neil on the, on, the, on the left and we have Valentina on the right. So she has, I don't know, 12 or something. Uh, geese that all have names for, you know, major astronauts. Um, so, and then, so we have the official pictures, and here, of course, we have the official traces of the uh, step of our dear geese uh, uh, on the moon. And it's both funny and poetic. I mean, it's a, it's a, or it's artifacts, and it's also a film, and it's re really deeply moving. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm done. And I want to uh, fin finish with this uh, video, which, hello, which is um, a group of artists that are doing electronic music, um, you know, music with um, images. And they have done a whole um, series, which is called Spaced Out, and of which I'm trying to have I'm trying. So we're basically using um, NASA footage that, that, that is available for free uh, on the internet, remixing it on electro music. Well, it might not be a tape, it's kind of. But, and they have um, a whole. So I suppose you've got it. What is fun? Oops. That's not what I wanted to do. So my 
conclusion. I have one slide conclusion, Roger. Sorry. As um, the space um, business, I would say, the space agencies and science in general are very much interested in how, well, one of their issues and one of their questions is how do we reach the general audience? How we bring all those questions of values and, and ethics and what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what science is, et cetera, et cetera, to the general audience? And their word is to outreach. And I think this is not the word we, we should use. And they should probably look at what the people out there are really doing with their stuff. And I have shown you images from the Space Conquest because I think they're really um, striking. But it's, they, they, there is a whole set of people doing the same with science. And for instance, with using the image, astronomical images and images from the sun and so on and so forth. And I think we should um, drop the outreach and go for enrich and just look at what's out there and bring it and try to find out how we, uh, you know, science can connect by looking at what the teenagers are already doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Annick. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, big uh, how can it be introduction to the things that I want to talk about today. Um, uh, I, I wear various hats, and one of my hats is as a poet, but another is as a sort of philosopher of science. Uh, in the 80s, I wrote um, an epic poem, uh, Genesis, an epic poem, which was about the terraforming of Mars the transformation of Mars into a habitable planet. And in the poem, uh, which is, you know, it's a family saga, it's also a kind of political conflict, it's about the, uh, 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 the, the kind of ethical, philosophical, political, technological problems of um, taking over another planet and transforming it into something uh, which uh, ends up in the poem being uh, something like an, you know, an extraordinary garden planet, uh, speaking about space gardens. Um, <coughs> now, uh, in a way, the, you know, this, this poem aroused a bit of a firestorm in various circles, including environmental circles, and raised some extremely interesting um, uh, uh, qu questions and problems. Um, if we... If we look at, uh, I mean, eventually NASA asked me to consult, and so for some years I was a consultant at NASA and uh, met Chris Mackay and uh, um, various places, uh, various people, including um, Carl Sagan, and um, uh, had a very interesting time. I met the Biospherians too. Um, the the word, the term, space culture, is very interesting because if we if we translate it in terms of uh, I I the meanings of those words, it comes out as something quite interesting because space, of course, is something that we, we talk about uh, instead of there being something there, there's just a space, right? So space, in one sense, is simply absence. It's something, it's a, you know, it's something where there isn't anything, right? And culture comes from the Latin root colore, which means to, to till ground. And culture, of course, is related to cultivation and to, uh, to cultivate. So you could say that um, space culture is, you could say it's um, tilling, the tilling of absence. Um, and so my poem was about the tilling of absence. But I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, about the kind of philosophical and if you could say ethical problems that arose in the, uh, uh, with this project. Do we have a right to transform and colonize another planet? 
And this involves, of course, the relationship of ownership and property. If we have a right to do something, it means that we have some kind of property right in it. Um, uh, we have you know, property rights in our own bodies and so on, and this is one of the, the uh, bases of, uh, of, of political freedom. Um, now, there are various arguments against our right to terraform another planet, to take charge of another planet, another piece of real estate, and terraform it. Uh, one of them is, I suppose, a theological argument, which is something like this. God owns nature. God gave us this planet to, for our use, but not other planets, and did not give permission to take those other planets. I mean, C.S. Lewis, for instance, his, his space dramas take that kind of view. Second kind of objection would, would, would really be a, a non-theistic objection. Things in nature own themselves. To appropriate them to ourselves is wrong. A third argument would be, though within an ecosystem some species naturally dominate, because they can, ecosystems themselves own themselves and have a natural right to, persi to persist. And another argument, no species should be allowed to dominate all the others. Let's look at the counter-arguments to those arguments. The first one might be something like this. Well, if you're going to take the theistic argument, why not interpret God's donation to us of the world in various religions? Um, why shouldn't that apply to the whole universe? Well, I might say, well, there are, might be other intelligent species out there, but then one could say, well, they are we too. Uh, there are other intelligent species, then, then there are, 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 they are really us, or we are really them. Um, and, uh, 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 or, or, uh, and then you might say, well, in fact, it, this is a real imperative to, for us to go out there and find them so that we uh, know how to properly allocate our property rights. Um, Again, another, another sort of counter-argument to the theistic argument would be something like this. Can a responsible ecological ethic be possible only in a theocracy in which only one interpretation of scripture is permitted? So you'd have a sort of Sharia law kind of situation. Um, but uh, uh, as you can see, there might be problems with that. Um, <clears throat> another argument, if every individual being owns itself, how can individual predators legitimately kill and eat their prey? Should we confiscate the wildebeest from the lion or the fly from the pitcher plant? Should we be permitted to take the lives of the bacteria and viruses in our bloodstreams and so on, or even in the, in the bodies of mosquitoes and rats? Um, Another argument, ecosystems are always in a, already in a state of change. Not just in degree, that is the relative numbers of individuals of the constituent species, but in kind. For instance, uh, replacement of whole species in the trophic regime, or even transformation of the shape of the food chain. This is going on all the time. Which moment of an ecosystem is the one that owns itself? If they all do, then no change in an e ecosystem is in and of itself less authentically itself than any other state, including, you might say, changes made by primate species like ourselves. To the response that ecosystems can transform themselves but should not be transformed by another species, a defender of terraforming could reply that the distinction between homo, uh, b between home species and other species is totally arbitrary. Every species is always already an invasive species. Sexual reproduction is the most radical weapon of invasion. Some are just better at it than others. All biomes are populated with invasive species. Some have been longer in place than others. And Finally, if humans are singled out as being essentially other than all others, we must reject evolution and appeal to some version of intelligent design, which takes us back to the whole theocratic uh, kinds of problems. So if terraforming is okay, 
then what should terraforming be? What is good terraforming? What would good terraforming be, be, be like? Now, this is not it's simply a, a kind of you know, science fiction question because we are already in the process of terraforming. We have th this planet, we've been terraforming it. We are changing it and we've qu changed it quite radically, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. Uh, yeah. For instance, we didn't like uh, the ozone hole that we had, so we, we eliminated CFCs and now the ozone, ozone hole is closing, but that's just one little tiny example. We're already, all, we are already terraforming uh, a anyway. Um, uh, but to return to the question, you know, what's good terraforming, which you could also, so you could also apply this to, for instance, um, uh, activities like, um, uh, like ecological restoration or um, reclamation, uh, you know, what is good reclamation, what is good, uh, um, uh, you, know, you could even say what is good farming, you know. <laughs> um, well, to all, in order to answer the question, we must first, but really, <clears throat> we must answer others. Good for what or for whom? It seems to me that three main stakeholders have a claim. The first two are obvious, or so it would appear. Good for human beings and good for the rest of nature. Note I say the rest of nature. I don't, I don't say human beings versus nature because that gets us into a, into a kind of uh, creationist view. Uh, human beings are somehow injected into nature. Um, uh, but even to put the issue in this way is already to raise problems. Um, I'm not going to talk about the third claim uh, uh, right now, but we'll come back to it. So we must assume that humans are part of nature. If humans are as natural as anything else, how do we examine the claims of one part of nature, humans, with respect to those of others? For instance, rare native fish or insects. Is a forest of humans, a suburb, more or less valuable than a forest of conifers? If there are lots of suburbs but only a few of that species of conifer, does the equation change? So I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions. Even if we give a, pr a priority to the good of nature as a whole, what criteria of goodness do we use? Should we be trying to maximize the biomass of a place? Or its living biomass? A large proportion of a tree's mass is simply dead heartwood. The living tree is simply the, the uh, just what's between the bark and the uh, and the and the heartwood. <coughs> um, should we be trying to maximise the richness in species, species richness, or its contribution, a place's contribution to the world's species richness, or its genetic variety, or its population of higher organisms? And what do you mean by higher organisms? Or organisms with higher nervous systems. Or the richness of the cultures, animal or human, that inhabit it. Or to change the criteria in other ways, the self-sustainingness of a place. Its inheritance of former ecological or genetic patterns. Its efficiency in using solar energy its independence of the resources of other parts of the planet. Each criterion has its own good arguments. Sheer biomass has the advantage of not putting us humans in the position of judging which biological material outranks which, and thus implicitly giving us the top position in a hierarchy of judgment. But if our, bi our own biomass is as it is, nearly the greatest of all, perhaps the greatest of all if you count our necessary technology, then we are the legitimate masters of the planet. Um, living biomass,
biomass um, avoids the definitional problems involved in the criterion of biomass. Is a caddis worm's jacket of gravel part of its body or not? Is a termite's nest biomass? Is dead heartwood biomass? Is my artificial hip joint a biomass? The undigested material in an owl's stomach? Biomass. Richness in species is our common ecological measure for obvious reasons. Contribution to species richness remedies the logical incompleteness of the criterion of species richness. Genetic variety speaks more directly to the health and adaptiveness of a living biome. Higher organisms not only act as a canary to signal ecological soundness lower down, but also as indexes of several other factors cited as evidence of environmental value. And this criterion avoids the problem of overvaluing, for instance, a landscape consisting only of a billion species of moss and lichens with wildly various genetic codes. The formula, organisms with complexly information processing nervous systems, sharpens the vague definition of higher organisms and also implies a criterion of what we might call epistemic value. <laughs> a landscape looked at by sentient in inhabitants may be worth more than a landscape with no observers. In the same spirit, the cultural criterion is sharper still. Social animals that can share their observations may be better observers than solitary ones. So, all of these kinds of questions. Self-sustainingness or sustainability, which is the, the great word right now, has the advantage of appealing to the sense of peace and balance that we associate with nature. The inheritance of past patterns of life has scientific value. Efficiency at converting solar energy is more easily measurable by physicists and gets us out of the philosophical tangle already implicit in this discussion. And independence has a nice ring of robustness about it. Each priority would yield different policies. The biomass of a climax forest in which most of the carbon is sequestered in dead heartwood might be outranked in the living biomass criterion by other biomes, for instance, a swamp or a fish farm. Two minutes? Three. Three. But uh, should we burn down climax forests to make room for more biodiverse prairies and, and savannas? A botanical garden might have more species yet and more endangered ones. A suburb might have more genetic diversity, more nervous systems, more culture. A few species with rich and complicated genomes and many strains might have more genetic variety than a large number of monoclonal species. A eutrophicated pond might use solar energy very efficiently indeed. Barren rock might be very self-sustaining. Or should we be trying to create Jurassic parks? If we accepted all the priorities I mentioned, how should we rank them or weight them with respect to each other? On what principles? So the question then becomes, what views of nature and of human beings will best serve good terraforming? Um, let me go, go on. I think I really need to get to my conclusion or uh, I will take up more time than I, uh, than I should. Um, if we see nature as it is, as essentially dynamic, open-ended, radically evolutionary, irreversible, and humans as part of its process, we may begin to have a basis for evaluating our various priorities and satisfying our various stakeholders. What about that third mysterious stakeholder that stands beside nature and the human part of nature and whose name we were not ready to discover? Let me try to name it now. It's the inner destiny of a given piece of landscape in itself, the suggestiveness of its beauty, its mysterious promise and potential for the future, the spiritual identity that the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins called its inscape. Now, let me try to rephrase what I just said in terms that are not particularly poetic. Um, can a better understanding of the nature of order, disorder, entropy, information, control, nonlinear dynamical processes, autonomy, and freedom help us develop a practical aesthetics and ethics of terraforming? 
Um, what I want to suggest is something like this, that um, uh, a, a living organisms uh, increase the amount of entropy in the universe around them. In so doing, they are also increasing the amount of information in the universe. Uh, Cl uh, Claude Shannon and John von Neumann showed us that well, what is the increase of disorder, of entropic decay in the world of thermodynamics can be the increase of informational order and organized complexity in a living organism. A single, let's look at this uh, more deeply, a single cause can have multiple effects. The laws of nature constrain these possible effects but do not reduce them to one. The world is branchy, it, it branches all the time. All the effects that don't completely neutralize each other do take place, distributed in number and intensity according to their probability over a bell-shaped curve. The difference between the number of bytes required to describe the cause state and the number required to describe the later effect state is the measure of the increase of its entropy and its thermo thermodyna thermodynamic disorder, but also the amount, the amount of new information that has entered the world. That difference also describes the degrees of freedom of the initial state. If there is only one branch, a single possible effect, the system has no freedom. If there are many, the system has free play to that extent. However, an event can bring about a set of events, uh, a, a, a set of effects that are either mutually reinforce, reinforcing or dissonant. The mutual reinforcement of those effects is the measure of its informational as opposed to its thermodynamic order. If that state of mutual reinforcement limits the number of new effects, we may call it a barren order. If it makes possible a further set of mutually reinforcing but productive effects, we may call it a rich order. The definition of evolutionary reproductive success in biology is very similar as many offspring as is consistent with the survival to reproduce of the offspring's offspring and of theirs in turn. Thus, we have a theoretical basis for choosing one set of actions in the environment over another, i.e. as a basis for deciding what is or is not good terraforming. Good terraforming is terraforming that creates the greatest freedom consistent with the richest order in the effect state that it produces. And that would be a kind of nasty technical way of talking about inscape and beauty. Thank you. Before I start, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you to please take out from your pockets or purses your ATM card. and a pen, put it in front of you, trust me, we'll get back to this. Now the question that, that Roger posited at the beginning of, of how in the world does a judge end up here is first of all, not always have I been a judge. In an earlier life I was a history professor and uh, through the need for gainful employment, I ended up uh, as uh, an historian writing the uh, history of launch operations of the Apollo Saturn V's at the Kennedy Space Center and then again uh, as a technical instructor on the Skylab program employed by McDonnell Douglas uh, Astronautics Corporation. This was in the 1970s, the early 1970s, when my office as a Skylab instructor was actually adjacent to where they were building the Apollo 17. So I'm quite uh, intimately familiar with that technology and what those things mean. And of course, uh, going back to that, you have a situation, and many of you may not be aware of this, but it was quite customary at that time to write your name on the inside of the vehicle that you were working on. And so there was this uh, sort of anthropomorphic symbiosis that took place between the workers and the vehicles that were launched and this made it an intensely personal environment. When the vehicle was successful, everyone felt very good. If it was not successful, then people felt very bad. Now, uh, Roger and, and, and Fred, uh, Professor Turner, uh, uh, alluded to 
uh, something that's very interesting uh, to me, and that is the relationship that we as human beings have to the technology that exists. And what is the impulse that drives this? And uh, I want to uh, note the connection that the two of them uh, had with the poet Eric Hoffer, who at the time of the launch of the Apollo 11 wrote a poem in which he basically posited the idea that the reason we stand and we look at the stars and that we want to reach out to them is fundamentally because we are part of nature, no different from a salmon swimming back to the pond where it was born. And therefore, our desire to fly to the stars is part and parcel of that. That is not necessarily an unique viewpoint, but Hoffer, uh, a former truck driver in Stevedore, uh, did indeed articulate it very brilliantly at the time. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that, that you know, we, we talk about sometimes about oxymorons in, in, the, in the language, uh, military intelligence, fighting for peace, legal ethics. Now, one of the things about legal ethics, of course, is you take a course in this in law school. But the thing that all ethics professors tell you at the beginning of the course is, if you don't have ethics when you come into law school, you will not get them from this course. <laughs> this immediately propels us back approximately 2,500 years to the time of Socrates, who started this entire uh, epistemological world by simply saying, know thyself. That's a great start. Of course, he didn't have computers, all of the various technologies that we have today. So you have to start somewhere. Know thyself. Emerson, of course, said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, that's kind of an extension of this into the 19th century. But what I want to suggest to you is that at the time of Socrates, when people had disputes or had ethical problems with each other, these were handled in a one-on-one -on -one sort of environment. And in technological terms, and certainly in the terms of the space program, we would call this a man-man interface. And that, for, ex for all practical purposes, dominated human relationships up until the latter part of the 18th and early part of the 19th century, when we began to develop machines as extensions of ourselves to perform particular tasks. This began a transition from a man-man interface to a man-machine interface. And the man-machine interface reached its high point, in my opinion, uh, with the space program. Because now you had a man becoming integrated into the machine in a very special way. The right stuff illustrates this very, very clearly. When the astronauts are introduced to the German scientists who have prepared what they call the capsule. And they are basically treating the astronauts as uh, non-thinking passengers. And the astronauts say, no, it's not going to be that way. We are going to assert some control over this machine as part of the reentry process or as part of the launch process, whatever. Human beings will remain a part of this project. That was true throughout a large part of the space program, certainly through the Apollo program. When you get to the shuttle program, things change quite dramatically. The shuttle was not necessarily a more complex vehicle. I find it difficult to imagine that the shuttle, uh, the approximate size of a DC-9 airliner, uh, could compete with the Saturn V, which weighed six and a half million pounds, uh, and uh, that was empty, of course. Then you add the fuel and it becomes seven and a half million pounds. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of component parts, 364 feet high, and it flies away. And all you get back is approximately the size of uh, the cubic volume of three telephone booths. I've always said only a society that created the no deposit, no return Coke bottle could have conceived of such a thing. But nonetheless, you still have men in control of the Saturn V and of the uh, command and service module and the lunar landing module and so forth. There is this man-machine interface where man is still the dominant feature. But with the shuttle, you have the addition of computers that control the spacecraft 
uh, in all of its details, including, in particular, the reentry phase. And uh, if you've seen uh, the movie Space Cowboys, one of my favorites, uh, of course, you have the situation where the pilots actually land it without the aid of the computer in the simulator and then, of course, in the real mission itself. This is a rare, in fact, almost impossible occurrence because the shuttle was so heavily computerized. During the latter part of the 20th century, you then have this transition, a very slow but very perceptible transition to what you could call a machine-machine interface, where the machines talk to each other and men really sort of react to the machines. Now this type of situation really comes into focus in the medical community. And as part of my duties as a district judge, one of my responsibilities was that if you were taken to an emergency room, you were not capable of consenting to medical treatment, but it was life or death, uh, the doctors would call me and ask me for an order granting permission for them to go forward and do whatever was necessary to try to save your life. It should be noted I was the only judge in Dallas County who was willing to undertake this responsibility because it is, after all, a life or death decision. Still made by a human being, allegedly. Now, where do I get the information? You're in the emergency room. You're hooked up to all sorts of machines that are measuring what we call your vital signs. The physicians read this, and they say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure he's going to make it. But let's call the judge anyway. So they call me, and my decision is, whether or not to retain life-sustaining equipment on this person so that the person, this, in, this unconscious individual, is now really an extension of the machines, isn't he? Machine, machine interface where the role of human beings has been diminished and therefore the ethical content of the decision-making process is diminished even though I might actually be making the decision. In more mundane terms, what this comes down to is, are you smarter than your car? If you're driving, for example, a 2012 uh, Mercedes E-Series sedan, you may not be. It, after all, will make you not collide with the car in front of you. And it may be, in fact, the car in front of you is smart, too, and telling its driver to speed up to prevent a rear-end collision. You are now totally reactive to the machine. Or, of course, if you are an alcoholic, it may not start unless you blow into it and speak to it sweetly and push the right buttons and enter the correct code. These are things that are real, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing novel about it. By the way, in the, in the process of making these decisions, these life and death decisions, there was an occasion where we had a 35-year-old man, no family. He was unconscious. He was slipping in and out of coma. He had AIDS, kidney failure, and liver failure. They called me and they said, uh, what do we do? And I said, is he in a coma? No. I said, uh, is he comfortable? Well, yes, we're trying to make him comfortable. I said, well, what's the prognosis? Well, based upon all of the test results that we have, the prognosis is not promising. And I said, well, I said, is he going to go into a, a permanent coma? And they said, we think so. And I said, well, call me back when he does. So they called me back a few hours later while I was having supper with my family, and they said, he's gone into coma, and one of two things is true. Either he will not come out and will die soon, or if he does come out, he will be a tomato. The decision is quite clearly an ethical one. Do I want to make a decision that causes this man to live, or more correctly, to exist as a tomato? And I said, 
make him comfortable, and let him go. This is a situation in which you find out where you live. This is how you know yourself in the true Socratic fashion. When we look at these machines, though, and what they can do for us, we're also driven to consider what Aeneas Nen says. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And this goes to the question of terraforming, doesn't it? Do we want to make the world over in our image or in its image? So now we have a situation where more and more of our lives default to machines, to computers. How many of you have had LASIK surgery? Okay. Don't be ashamed. Me too. <laughs> now why do you think I'm holding up my hand? Not just a demonstration here. Yeah. That was done by a computer. The doctor measured your eye with lasers which evaluated the spherical or not so spherical shape of your eyeball and then calculated, based upon the program, how much should be shaved off in order to give you nice, clear vision. Then you went into the operating theater, and what happened? You're drugged into your inability to move. Does this mean you're unconscious? No. You're wide awake. As they slice away part of your cornea with a computer-driven knife. We now have made a, another transition, haven't we? Further into the machine man world, where the man is the extension of the machine. Yes, the machine is doing something we want it to do, but we are not in control of it. Last month in the United Kingdom was demonstrated another step in this ev evolution towards actually what we would call transhumanism. This is the phrase that's coming out now. And this is a man who is an engineer and, uh, and a physician, and he put a, a chip in his hand, in his arm, right about here, and connected it to the nerves that cause his hand to open and close. And wirelessly his brain controls a robotic hand across the room and makes it open and close. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the six million dollar man. We can make him better, faster. Maybe look like me instead of Lee Majors. <laughs> but the point is, not can we, but should we. Now, look at that card you have in front of you. On the back of it is a magnetic strip, and you take that to your ATM and you put it in, and it says, we've given you $200, and it gives you a receipt, and it gives you your card back, but it hasn't given you the money. The bank now sues you for the money. This is a real case, by the way. I presided over this case. The bank presents a computer printout from the machine that did not give you the money. And you stand there and say, but judge, the machine didn't give me the money. The bank says, but judge, we've got a computer printout here. <coughs> Who's the witness? Who's the witness? The machine. The machine, the machine that just ripped you is now testifying against you, and you cannot cross-examine it. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, that card electronically completes the machine so that it can do its task. You electronically join the machine. That's what's going on. So what is the difference between the card and the pen. Now 
Exactly. That is the key. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the definition of cyber ethics. Cyber ethics is definable as the tension between fundamental and traditional concepts of right, wrong, good, and evil, and the ability of technology to diminish them either actually or apparently in the human condition. And until and unless we are cognizant of that, and how it is happening on a daily basis in our society and in our world, then we are very much in danger of a situation where <clears throat> the $6 million man is being created by people who don't understand what's going on. And to quote Clemenceau, he said, war is too important to be left to the generals. I suggest that building the $6 million man may be too important to be left solely to those who can do it. Thank you. Well, thank you to the speakers for respecting the time. So we have time for vigorous debate and questions. Maybe we should terraform Dallas as a start. <laughs> <laughs> talk about space culture, but, you know, it, it, it would seem to me, and I just sort of throw this out for anyone to respond to, that, that the degree of penetration of this space culture in the, in the U.S., and I think it's probably fair to say the other, other developed countries, is really very, very superficial. That, you know, if you look, for example, and I'm just, as a very practical matter, if you look at polling, for example, um, the concern about uh, space, space activities, space travel, uh, the commercialization of space, um, it simply, you know, it just really doesn't register that much with the public. Uh, polling would suggest that there's very little support, for example, to, you know, returning to the moon, uh, virtually no support for uh, interplanetary travel, uh, travel to Mars over the next three or four decades. Um, and that's in spite of the fact that you know, over the last 30 or 40 years within the popular culture, you have you know, these television shows like Star Trek. You know, there's a, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain um, very superficial um, presence, but it doesn't really seem to have translated into anything substantially more profound, at least at the mass level. So I'm just wondering if, you could, if anyone could address that. Well, I mean, it, it really depends what you call space culture. What you define as space culture is what the engineers or scientists care about. Um, but if you consider every, everybody's watching um, uh, weather forecast on TV, okay? Weather forecast on TV is just based on space pictures, okay, and on satellites. Uh, and it's absolutely normal for all of you, for every single person in the United States and, the, and in developed country to have a huge man or woman bubbling about small earth saying it's going to rain in Dallas tomorrow, okay? This is space culture. If you want to go to Paris, what are you going to do? Google, okay? Google map, Google earth, Google view. What is this? It's space culture. It's, uh, again, the Earth, Paris, or Dallas seen from above, and so on and so forth. You, you have those damn things that are talking now that are called uh, GPS, and you say, where am I? I'm at UT Dallas. I want to go to the DMA route. So and then you say, tell your life of the next crossroad. Mm -hmm. Who is Irritating, <laughs> irritating voice. I mean, his voice, very irritating. This is space culture because you would not have GPS without space, and so on and so forth. So, what is what is it? What, what we call space culture? It, it, it's John, what you wanted to respond it. to? Yeah, I, I, I've had this this uh, discussion numerous times over the years, and and I, I just remind people that 
If you have a friend uh, who has a pacemaker, he owes his life to NASA. Uh, every woman who cooks with a Teflon pan owes that convenience to NASA. There, it's very difficult, and Roger touched on it earlier, uh, it's very difficult in our modern day to escape the impact of the space program and the R&D that came from it, and still does come from it, together with the aesthetic aspect that uh, Enik uh, has talked about. Uh, you, you, uh, you can uh, look at uh, the construction of modern buildings, uh, the materials that are used, uh, and uh, even, even advertisements for uh, air conditioning systems. They talk about the, the R rating, and all, all of that comes from NASA. That's all a product of the Apollo program. And you, you sit there and you say, oh, but. And unfortunately, I think one of the failings of the human species is that we, we get very accustomed to things very quickly, and then we take it for granted. You know, I, I sometimes say the first time you do something is a novelty, the second time it's tradition. And it's almost that fast for, uh, for the space business. Yeah, Fred, you wanted to? Yeah, uh, I think that what Ewell is referring to is the real phenomenon of the way in which we, uh, you know, how can I put it? Uh, you know, to put it in, uh, in, in, the term, in the terms of space enthusiasts, the way in which the world essentially uh, did not keep its sort of promise of really going out to the to the planets. We were techni technologically capable, uh, you know, at a cost which would have been considerably less than one of our wonderful world wars of going to Mars 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, uh, I, I think, though, that, uh, and we sort of, uh, uh, we, we chickened out in some ways. And, you know, my poem, Genesis, is partly about that, uh, about why and what happened to us in, in not going that further distance. But I, I think if you look at, if you look at, the, uh, at the moment where, or the, the period when Europe was about to explode out into the rest of the world, um, uh, there was a time before Columbus uh, when people like Prince Henry, of, uh, Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, was pushing expedition after expedition a little bit further and further down the coast of Africa, and it was a, not a very nice coast, and th there didn't seem to be very much return for it. Um, but at the same time, what was going on in Europe was a kind of increasing interest in alien and different places, and the, there being possibly a different world of being utopias, of being strange um, political and social possibilities somewhere else. And eventually that was the thing that maybe sort of tipped the whole thing over, and then when Columbus comes back, the whole thing s suddenly starts to, uh, uh, to, to, to cascade. There's a sort of cascade of exploration from there. So I, I have a final comment on that. Um, about ten years ago, I wrote an editorial called The End of the Space Age, where I referred to the Chinese emperor who decided to burn his fleet. Yes. Uh, otherwise, they would have, in fact, they would have been the American Empire. Uh, they were all the way around Africa, and the trading systems were set up, and he decided to burn his fleet. And that comes back into the, the cultural imagination of whether your future, in his case, included that fleet or not. What's really interesting is now, when I go to the International Space Congresses, the Chinese have, you know, they have a totally internally driven agenda. Some of it is political. They're using the symbolic actions. If you go to India, it's a slightly different discourse. If you go to Brazil, they, they're building into their space program. And so if you talk about human culture, not just American culture, in fact, the space age didn't come to an end. Uh, when uh, the, the U.S. lost its, uh, <laughs> its will, uh, and so it's interesting how that and it comes back to your idea of, of how that cultural imagination ended up being a global imagination. And so, uh, and that does become a, a cultural value question of whether or not 
that is part of your, the valuable future. And it's really, it's really quite striking how differently China, India, Brazil articulate these things. They use some of the same building blocks, um, but it's going to be different routes, and it's going to be much more robust than the U.S. Congress. <laughs> uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, this type of interdisciplinary uh, panel forum, very interesting to me. Uh, I'm going to ask a question a moment. Uh, I, I come from an area of teaching ethics and uh, theology and psychology. And we're having symposia here in Dallas, quite widespread. Uh, this fall, it started already. Would you people be interested in serving on programs or panels? And uh, what would be your particular uh, contribution? You know, what would you care to speak on? And if not, why not? I think the answer to the first part of your question is obviously yes, or we wouldn't be here at all. Yes. Okay, I'll, t I'll give you one. <laughs> Does a city like Dallas make sense? Does what? A city like Dallas make sense? Does the city of Dallas make sense? Looking 300 years into the future, does it make sense to put a major human population in a location like Dallas where the water is not going to be adequate? The climate is changing rapidly enough. The agriculture is no longer sustainable. The oil economy is shifting to such an extent that the city, when oil is $30 a gallon or $80 a gallon, which will, be, will come, does a city like Dallas make sense? It never did. It was an accident. So, you know, that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, no, I mean, so no, I just came here three yeah. months ago. And it took, you're talking about legal ethics. <laughs> so civic planning in Dallas <laughs> is an oxymoron, right? So there's a really interesting problem. If we you'd have be to willing, <laughs> willing under, you know, a rubric. Now, like you know, other cities have different challenges. I lived in San Francisco, and does a city like San Francisco make sense on the major <laughs> earthquake fault of the Pacific, yeah. right? So each one of these places it has its own internal uh, challenges. Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry, go ahead, Fred. Uh, and following up on that, one might then, then ask, uh, you know, does, does, it, does this uh, planet make sense as a, place, <laughs> as a place for life to exist? I mean, if you think of the, you, you know, the bombardment of, Earth, of the Earth by major asteroids and so on, yeah. it, it doesn't look like a really good idea. In fact, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the life itself is a kind of fantasy that matter puts together. Inanimate matter, if it could speak or think, would say life is this sort of insane fantasy game that, that some of our molecules have been playing, and it really can't last. I mean, a piece of granite can, be, can stick around for billions of years. The trees have done but, better than us. But, uh, you know, living, living organisms, I mean, they, 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 just, uh, they just flutter away. You know, like well, they're not cockroaches and sharks. <laughs> and dandelions. They will survive the thermonuclear holocaust. <laughs> Let me just say, uh, who, the planning of this is, is very helpful because uh, I, used to, I taught here at UTD before another place. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm favorably impressed with what's happened. Do we have time for one more question from the back of the room? or the judge is still making life or death decisions, so d d drive safely when you go home. <laughs> Actually, are you still taking those phone calls? Thankfully, no. no. Uh, after I uh, took senior status, uh, they uh, relieved me of that duty. But ironically, nobody has taken it up. If nobody's been willing to, to, to do it. Uh, it's, it, and it, I suppose if, if I were to, to look back on all the various cases, I mean, uh, there. The simple legal reality is that what I was doing was completely violative of these people's constitutional rights to make these decisions. And uh, that those came to a head with cases where an infant born to a family of Jehovah's Witnesses needed a blood transfusion. And I ordered the blood transfusion in complete violation of their religious beliefs and, uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, 
people used to be very critical of the fact that I did those uh, types of things, made those types of decisions. And they said, you know, you realize that because you're violating the Constitution, that uh, somebody one of these days is going to sue you for it. And I said, yeah, that's certainly a, a possibility in our modern litigious society. I said, but I'm not even going to hire a lawyer for that. Uh, if I'm sued, I'll walk up in front of the jury and say, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I violated his constitutional rights. I ordered the doctors to save his life, and that's how he's here to sue me today. And if I did something that you object to, well, then go ahead. I don't think I'd have too much of a You don't problem. sound like a Texas judge to me, John. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my Democrat friends accuse me of being a crypto-Democrat. <laughs> Okay, I think we're out of time, right, Micah? So, uh, coffee break.